Well, good morning. It's Friday, so it's time for another Gross Path Challenge. This one is Gross Path Challenge number 25, and it comes to us from the descriptive course of 2004, given on the campus of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, and featuring a lot of great old codochromes from the AFIP archive, some of which you can find today in Noah's archive. Well, let's go ahead and get out our pens and our papers and give it a try. Case number one is tissue from a turkey. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay. Well, this is probably not a, this very old slide, it's probably not a, a commercially raised uh, turkey. Um, the liver is enlarged, has these large raised white lesions. These are granulomas. This is multifocal coalescing hepatic granulomas. And the cause is Mycobacterium avium. And this is something that's not seen in commercial poultry today because uh, of the obviously the husbandry practices, or it's a disease that takes a long time to develop and commercial poultry just isn't around long enough for the disease to develop but you can still see it in wild turkeys um, and it's a real problem in zoos i remember when i was a resident the first uh, my first three weeks we would go out every couple of days to the zoo and we would post all these really expensive birds and they were just filled with uh, these granulomas there's not a tremendous uh, zoonotic risk for mycobacterium avium um, which is the cause here. And uh, Mycobacterium genovensi has been identified in a number of cases, but there are probably a lot of the bacteria we just used to lump into Mycobacterium avium. You could break them out into all sorts of new strains. And uh, it's everywhere we touch, on every surface. As I drink my cup of coffee here, um, I'm getting a nice dose of Mycobacterium avium, but I'm immunocompetent, and so it's not a problem for me. Um, you will probably see granulomas throughout the intestine. Most a Mycobacterium avium infections are, uh, they do come in orally, so they tend to affect the GI tract, and uh, uh, the liver is part of the GI tract. These bacteria will get access to it through the portal system. Another consideration for this that you might see in uh, uh, backyard birds would be coligranuloma or E. coli, a very interesting disease um, in which uh, the E. coli is purported to cause granulomas. And there's been some recent talk um, because Koch's postulates were never fulfilled for coligranuloma. You could give birds coligranuloma and you'd never get this. That uh, it may be the result of infection with another uh, parasitic organism, Tetratrichomonas gallinarum, and that uh, uh, coligranuloma or Hari's disease has been misdiagnosed for over uh, 60 years. So uh, probably some uh, interesting reading on that particular subject, but I'll leave that to you and let's go on to the, another, the next slide. Slide number two is tissue from an ox. Give yourself about a minute and give me a morphologic diagnosis. Okay, I think this one is stri fairly straightforward. This could be a calf, this could be an ox, um, but we have these pearlescent white growths across the omentum and until proven otherwise, this is a mesothelioma. The only th other thing that really looks like this, if this was a white-tailed deer and you were uh, in the upper Midwest, maybe uh, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, especially Michigan, um, this would be a, an appearance that you might see along the pleura, along the peritoneum for uh, Mycobacterium bovis, same sort of pearlescent uh, nodules on the serosal surfaces. But until proven otherwise, we're gonna go with mesothelioma in a cow. Okay, slide number three is tissue from a cat. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time is up. Now first, as we look at this, we can see the cut ed edges of the ribs. So. The, uh, and we're looking at the probably the liver here. This is uh, a 
view of the lung. The first thing we have to figure out is what is good lung and what is bad lung. Okay, and the lightish pink areas are the areas of lung which are still inflated. All of the rest of the lung here is atelectatic because it contains an exudate, a granulomatous exudate, which is multifocal to coalescing and is the result by infection with a lurostrongulus abstrusus, a lungworm of cats. It's more often seen in feral cats, maybe some uh, wild felids like bobcats. And, and most of the cases that I've seen have been in association with other diseases um, like uh, FIP or, or feline leukemia. Um, cats tend to tolerate this parasite extremely well um, and only in severe infections um, do they develop respiratory disease. You may find this as an incidental finding in immunocompetent cats, but it is, uh, you will see the adults and the larvae and the eggs all within the same alveoli. You may see them in the airways, where they, but they do develop in the alveoli that get refluxed into the airways. And of course, the inflammation that they cause will result in atelectasis and these parts of the lung that are represented by the, the darker pink are ineffective in the transfer of oxygen. So that's allurostrongulus abstrusus. The etiologic diagnosis would be pulmonary allurostrongulosis. The morphologic diagnosis would be a multifocal to coalescing granulomatous interstitial pneumonia. Saying interstitial pneumonia by itself is not good enough. Interstitium locates the area of the inflammation. So you still have to pick, is it lymphohistiocytic, lymphocytic, granulomatous, suppurative, whatever. In this case, it is a long-standing infection and it is granulomatous inflammation. Slide number four is tissue from a cat. And I need a morphologic diagnosis. Okay, time's up. Well, it's an interesting picture because on one side we have a thyroid gland and a nice pair of thyroid gland. On the other side, we have nothing. Now, I can't tell you exactly what happened in this particular picture, but that thyroid is way too large. And so this would be, I'm gonna take a wide range of answers on this one. It could be a, a single large thyroid adenoma Cats very traditionally get multiple thyroid adenomas. People call them areas of adenomatous hyperplasia. I think I would take all of that. And the question is, why is the thyroid gland on the other side missing? Um, I know that one of my cats over the years developed uh, hyperthyroidism. We removed the thyroid and uh, it did very well. So that's what might've happened in this case. So we might've had an overzealous veterinary student get in there and start hacking away before the, uh, the professor could tell him, stop, stop, you're, you're killing my picture. Okay, sorry, there's been an interruption on my part. So I lost my train of thought. I had to go help someone change a tire, give a lecture on ferrets and go to round. So here, three hours later, we're gonna continue our discussion on this particular slide. Okay, so there are a couple of different uh, ways that you go after this. I prefer the term adenoma. Um, a lot of people still use the term adenomatous hyperplasia. When I think about hyperplasia, I think about goiter, goitrogenic foods, things like this. A number in these, uh, these adenomas, which may be multiple, there have been uh, a number of papers pointing at uh, point mutations in uh, CRAS and, and the TSH receptor itself uh, and G protein. These animals also have been reported to have autoantibodies against the TSH receptor. So, so I, I find the, uh, uh, the point mutation and the TSH receptor uh, interesting because this allows it to be continually turned on. You have compression of adjacent tissue. You may have, uh, so I'm more of an adenoma kind of guy, but if you put down adenomatous hyperplasia, it's widely used. So I am going to give you full credit. Uh, thyroid carcinoma is a th really a thing in the dog. 
and other species, they tend to invade additional tissue. They metastasize widely. Cats usually stays restricted to the thyroid glands. This parathyroid also looks rather large. About 70% of cats with thyroid disease also have concomitant parathyroid hyperplasia, and I don't have a, uh, an explanation for that, but uh, it is common. I don't know the age of this cat. Maybe this cat also was so old and had chronic renal failure, but, and that might be an explanation on a lot of these, because we do see them in cats 13, 14, 15 years of age, and they may have bad kidneys as well, which often <clears throat> is not mentioned in the story. So you just see a lot of parathyroid hyperplasia with this. Okay, let's move on to slide number five. And this is tissue from an ox. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and two possible causes? Okay, time's up. I probably could have told you this was a feedlot steer or a calf. This is a, 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 a morphologic diagnosis. This is focally extensive fibrinonecrotic laryngitis. Look at the yellow sort of uh, a diphtheritic membrane on the larynx of this animal. This is a pretty severe case. These are the kind of animals that may asphyxiate due to these lesions, and certainly they're going to be inhaling little bits of it. It'll go down into their lungs, and because the two causes that I'm looking for are either Fusobacterium necrophorum or Haemophilus somnus, you could get pulmonary abscesses subsequent to a lesion like this. Uh, when uh, steers, calves go into feedlot, um, they're exposed to a lot of things they're not exposed to before due to concentration, due to the stress of shipping, all of that. <clears throat> and they often come down with uh, subclinical or even clinical cases of bovine respiratory disease complex, whether it's respiratory syncytial virus, whether it is all of the various bacterial components of that, including manheimia. But they end up with uh, a mild respiratory infection, which may cause coughing. And when they cough, um, they could rub together and cause friction on the folds of the larynx and because Fusobacterium and Histophilus are omnipresent commensals in the oral and the respiratory uh, tract of these animals, they become infected with that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I guess I could l consider for a moment would be squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx, but this sort of yellow crumbly appearance to it um, rather than a hemorrhagic uh, uh, appearance, uh, proliferative appearance. It doesn't leave me with a, a, an overall feeling of uh, squamous cell carcinoma, but if you came up with that, you can see that in uh, uh, horses and ruminants uh, from time to time in the larynx. I, I don't know what they do. Maybe they, uh, they yawn a lot when they look directly into the sun, but it's not an uncommon spot for squamous cell carcinoma. So, uh, uh, I'll give you an attaboy, but no points for squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx in this particular case. Okay, slide number six is tissue from a dog. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. William's rule of bubbles number one is when you see it, I want you to think of cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Okay, we do have a, uh, a bicornar luminal organ here. This is the uterus, and this is a tremendous case of cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Um, cystic endometrial hyperplasia and pyometria are one of those conditions that I was taught something very different when I went to school many, many years ago when dinosaurs ro roamed the earth. Um, and we were taught that uh, cystic endometrial hyperplasia uh, is a aberration of estrogen and progesterone and and that's what caused it, and then it would progress to uh, to pyometra if there was uh, bacterial overgrowth. Over the last 20 or 30 years, I think the thinking has shifted on this, and you can get cystic endometrial hyperplasia in the dog from chronic irritation, from a number of things, including bacteria. So it could very much be that you get bacteria first that causes the cystic endometrial hyperplasia, and then if you get the overgrowth, it's pyometra. Um, in a number of species, especially your rodent species, you are going to see cystic endometrial hyperplasia uh, in mice and rats and rabbits uh, as more of a consequence of age, and it's 
Uh, there is no bacterial infection. There is no accompanying endometritis, but you just see it all the time uh, in older laboratory rodents and rabbits. But when you think about bubbles, okay, especially in this, if you didn't pick up on the organ uh, first, uh, I always ju just think, okay, can it be cystic endometrial hyperplasia? And that's what it was here. Okay. Hey, slide number seven is from a dog as well. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Take your time. I'll have a sip of this cold cup of coffee. Okay, time's up. Uh, I think that everybody got that we are looking at the testis and the size of the epididymis is about twice the size of the testis. That's not good. <clears throat> That's not right. We're probably going to have a, a two-part uh, morphologic diagnosis. The area with the hemorrhage um, and necrosis to me is the more important part. Um, it has been enlarged and this is a multifocal to coalescing granulominous or if you want to say necrosuppurative, I'll take that too, <clears throat> epididymitis with testicular atrophy. So the epididymis is involved, probably there's a chronic infection, so at this point it's probably granulomatous. Um, and then you have compensatory atrophy. This this testis does not look, uh, it looks a little bit white, it looks a little bit shriveled, so I think we have atrophy as well. That's the, not the important part. The epididymal lesion is, <clears throat> and when this this uh, uh, particular slide was taken in the U.S., probably there was a much higher incidence of brucella canis than there is now, but of course we do see it in a lot of other parts of the world um, where animals aren't castrated as often. And so this is due to brucella canis. Now, if you said that this is due to another gram negative, that the animal had prostatitis and developed epididymitis, I'm going to give you full credit too. This could be a coliform or something like this. Let's just say that this is from an age where brucella canis was a significant consideration in our dog population. Okay. Let's go on to slide number seven. And this is a goodie, and this is from an eider duck. And I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. Put your, your pen down. And an eider duck is a duck from very cold climates. And this is a condition that we see very often in, uh, in birds that are, that are put into zoos um, and normally, this one was taken uh, probably at the, at the National Zoo, and you know they're used to a very difficult, different climate, and it's very stressful. You take a penguin. This is what a real problem in penguins in zoos because the, the environment is not what they're used to, and it's hotter. And so I think, in my experience, this is uh, what you see. But you can see it in any in any bird that is stressed or immunosuppressed. And we are looking at the exact same sort of furry growth that you would see if you left a ham sandwich uh, out on the countertop for about a week. This is mycelial growth of Aspergillus fumigatus. Okay, the morphologic diagnosis is going to be a multifocal to coalescing granulomatous air sacculitis. And what we're looking at this edge here, this whole thing is one of the air sacs that has been opened up. And you can see it on the Salome cavity, you can see it. But it's probably within the air sacs. It's a great place. This looks like the lung right up here. And these are the air sacs going down there, this furry growth of, uh, of aspergillus. Initially, it'll be primarily heterophilic, and then if the animal survives long enough, it'll be a little more granulomatous. If you said it was a heterophilic air sacculitis, I think I'm, I can give you credit for that one as well. But a real problem in immunosuppressed birds, um, it could be a problem in young chicks. They call it brooder pneumonia. Um, but exotic birds in atypical climactic environments, you're going to get aspergillus. Okay, and I know everybody's killing this test. I'm going to throw you a, a real soft pitch here. 
This is tissue from a dog, and I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Oh, and give me another lesion caused by this agent in another organ. How about that? Make it a little trickier. Okay, give yourself about 90 seconds. I asked for a lot of information. Okay, time is up. What a great picture this is. And this one is available uh, in Noah's Archive. I think it's used in a couple books, maybe even Dr. Green's uh, textbook on infectious agents. A wonderful textbook. And I had the privilege of learning under Dr. Green at the University of Georgia. What a smart man. Okay, so we're looking at a multifocal to coalescing necrohemorrhagic enteritis. You could say segmental. Looks like a couple, excuse me, a couple of different segments, but if you want to say segmental, that is fine. Okay, notice I didn't say just hemorrhagic. Don't ever say just hemorrhagic because there's so few diseases that cause purely hemorrhage in the, in the absence of necrosis. When you're looking at hemorrhage, you're usually looking at necrosis, but because necrosis really doesn't have any color, it's always covered up by the hemorrhage. So hemorrhage and necrosis, necrohemorrhagic enteritis, and William's first rule of red guts in dogs and cats is until proven otherwise, it is parvovirus. Canine parvovirus type 2 in dogs, uh, feline panleukopenia virus in cats, but they cause segmental uh, hemorrhage and necrosis. Hey, here's another other, another great lesion. Dr. Paul Stromberg would say corroborating evidence. Um, and that is this ground glass appearance. It's a thin layer of fibrin over the affected intestine, okay? And if you ever have to run the gut of something and you're looking for a very focal lesion, first look for the area that has fibrin covering the serosa because that is where the lesion is going to be. Okay, so uh, canine parvovirus type 2 is what I'm looking for. Canine parvovirus type 1, the minute virus of dogs, really doesn't give much of a lesion. It is an enteritis. It gives you beautiful inclusions, much better than canine parvovirus type 2 does, but doesn't give you that ne necrosis and hemorrhage. So canine parvovirus type 2 infects uh, canids, wild canids, uh, raccoons, uh, a couple of other species. And I asked you for a lesion in another organ. Um, I, could, I could give you a couple of different ones. You could certainly have lymphocytolysis in lymph nodes. Remember, the parvovirus is a replication deficient. They don't replicate in, they have to have cells in a certain stage of division to replicate. And there's always um, cells in that stage in your lymph nodes, uh, in your bone marrow, and in the crypts of the gut because those are constantly replicating to repopulate the villar enterocytes, so you always have some dividing cells in there. If you put uh, necrotizing myocarditis, I'll give you credit, but just realize that that window is only from up to maybe eight or ten weeks, and then it stops. And uh, so you, if the animal's infected after 10 weeks, you're not going to see any lesions in the heart. Generally, those lesions become manifest around six months of age when the animal's really growing and the heart just has so much scar tissue from myocardial necrosis and inflammation back between two to eight or 10 weeks of age. Um, cerebellar hypoplasia, same thing, has to be infected in utero or within a week or two after birth, and then you can have some cerebellar hypoplasia in animals that are infected with canine parvovirus type 2. So just realize that those lesions, are you're going to have to infect them very early uh, in their neonatal life or in utero. But you can always see uh, uh, lymphocytolysis, lymphoid necrosis in animals with, of any age with active parvoviral infection. And moving on to our last slide. I want everyone to have a great weekend, so I'm going to throw this one at you. All I want is a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay. Morphologic diagnosis, slow pitch, multifocal coalescing, ulcerative stomatitis. There's probably even a little bit of chylitis here. I'll bet you there is a ulcerative gingivitis. But there's ulcers along the, and anywhere that there's friction when this animal eats, um, that epidermis is going to come off. And there's a number of causes, but the one that uh, should be at the top of everybody's list is bovine pestivirus, the causative agent of 
bovine viral diarrhea and mucosal disease. Bovine viral diarrhea probably wouldn't cause lesions like this. It's going to cause uh, some diarrhea. But if the animal was, was infected with a strain in utero of the non-pathogenic cytopathogenic form, and then after it was born, you know, between the ages of like eight months and two years or something, it gets infected with another strain, which is cytopathic, then you get this disease caused mucos called mucosal disease. Not well named because it affects epithelium throughout the body. Um, it circulates in the, uh, uh, in, in the mononuclear cells and then eventually gets into the dermis, passes to the epidermis and causes epidermal necrosis. And because you have uh, necrosis in the basal epithelium, you are going to lose the epithelium. It will sort of shed off or slough or separate uh, in a lot of parts of the body. The GI tract is probably the best known. That's why they call it mucosal disease. So this animal's eating. That epithelium is not well held on there because the cells that are anchoring it are uh, virally infected. They are necrotic, and it comes off uh, in large areas. Often you'll have confluent necrosis at the back part of these ridges of the soft palate. Um, and you'll see it in a number, any of the squamous epithelial line parts of the gut tends to leave the abomasum alone. And then uh, uh, you start seeing lesions again in the, uh, uh, in the small intestine and colon. Um, but you can also see lesions uh, in between the claws of the hoof as they rub together or around the genitals and in, in the folds around the vulva. You know, places where you get a lot of friction. There's a lot of lesions associated with this. <laughs> So cause bovine pestivirus. There are a number of other agents that will cause ulcerative stomatitis. Um, uh, bovine parapox virus, it tends to be raised and ulcerated only in the center. You have to consider that. How about IBR? IBR is fairly nonspecific. It does really cause some problems in the uh, upper respiratory tract, including the, the nose and the sinuses, but it will also affect the epithelium, the squamous epithelium from the mouth on down to the omasum. You can have ulcerations there. I think that you might have to consider, although it's been eradicated, bovine morbillivirus. And there's a number of other ones. Even blue tongue will give you a lesion like this. But something, uh, and let's not forget the vesicular lesions um, as well. Hopefully, you'll never see a case of that. So let's put bovine pestivirus at the top of this list. And once again, as I always say, look at the area around the gingiva. A lot of friction going on there with the animal chewing rough feed, so you're going to get ulceration there as well. Okay, I think we covered it. I well, got it in within 30 minutes. A great way, hopefully, for you to start your weekend with a high grade on this test. And uh, we'll see you next Friday for another Gross Path Challenge.